Let's get connected. He's the author of the book Illusions of Entrepreneurship, among many other publications, so many and so relevant publications that he was actually awarded the most prestigious award worldwide in, entrepreneur in entrepreneurial uh, research. He's been teaching in many universities all over the world, not only in the States, but also in the UK, China, New Zealand, and he's currently the Professor of Entrepreneurial Studies in Case Western Reserve University in the States. Um, having said this, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for us to give the stage to Professor Scott Shane. Thank you very much. Uh, great. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. It's really nice to uh, come out and have a chance to talk about my favorite um, topic, which is to talk about entrepreneurship. I'm going to talk about uh, a topic that I think is the one of the areas that I worked on the most that's the most relevant to this audience, and that is talking about academic entrepreneurial activity, in particular the focus on these creation of university spin-off companies and what they do, the impacts that they have. So let me try to just define what I'm going to do here because I'm going to be covering a variety of different topics. And I want to say, you know, this is a bit of a mixed audience. Some of the audience are academics who do research on the topics, and for you, there's no uh, how did I get any answers from any studies in here. It's all just what did we find information. So if you want to know more about the studies that underlie this, send me um, an email uh, message and I'm happy to send you any and all of that information. What I'm trying to do is make this open to people who are also on the practitioner side and the policy side about what to do with this information that we found about university uh, spinoffs. So what I'm going to do first is I want to define this term. I want to be very specific about what kinds of companies on campuses we're talking about. Then I want to talk about what's so good about them. Why, if you're a policymaker, do you want to have these? Talk a little bit about some trends in this activity. And again, I'm an American coming from the US, done most of my work in the United States, so the trends I'm talking about are the ones in the US. I know relatively little about the trends elsewhere. I only know what other people tell me about the trends elsewhere, so I'm focused on that, um, the context that I know. I'm going to talk about then the key things that we found over the years about entrepreneurship and university spin-offs, the kinds of university characteristics that make this happen more readily, the kinds of technologies for which this activity tends to occur more re readily, the structure of the IP portfolios at academic institutions that facilitate these businesses being formed, the way that people have succeeded in building companies off of campuses, the kinds of people who have succeeded in doing this, and then at the very end, a few of the problematic trends that have emerged from this growth in this activity. So first of all, I want to be very specific here. This talk, this topic is university spin-offs. By a university spin-off, or if I was in the UK, the corresponding term would be spin-out, because American and British English can never be the same, right? <laughs> it is companies founded to exploit university assigned intellectual property. Now this is very specific because in many, many, many countries, universities have the rights to IP that's created from research of faculty, staff, and in many cases, students. Now there's a lot of variation on this, um, in fact, there's some notable exceptions like Sweden where the structure is different. But in the, in the US, when researchers conduct research, the rights to that, the output of that invention belong to the university and then the academic could license back like any other licensee that IP and make use for that. Of that. Now that's important because university spin-offs are a subset of a broader topic called academic entrepreneurship. So a couple years ago with some colleagues who are now at the University of Toronto and the University of Bologna, we did a survey of academic entrepreneurship in the United States. 
people. We, inter we surveyed about 12,000 academics, and what we found was that about a third of the people who were in the process of starting companies were doing so on the basis of the formal university IP. So for every one university spin-off, there's two academics starting a business that doesn't involve the university IP, just the results of research. And some of those can be very successful as well. I could talk more about that individually to people if they're interested, but the focus here is on the spin-offs, the ones that use the IP. So who cares? Why should we have that? What's so great about these things? Well, one of the key things about university spin-offs that researchers discovered about 15 years ago is that there is a division of labor, if you will, between who takes inventions off of university campuses. One set of inventions tend to go to large, established, often public companies. Others go to new formed businesses. So one of the key things is spin-offs are good because they're taking technology that otherwise no one else would take. There's a division of labor. The second thing is universities. I don't know how it is in Europe, but in the United States, money matters a great deal at the levels of university administration. There's never enough of it. What universities have discovered is that when spin-off companies get created, the university will make more money from equity positions in those companies than they ever will make from licensing out their technology on a royalty basis. So that's the second big reason why they care, right? If you talk to a university president or a university provost in the United States, that's why they would care. The third thing is they create jobs. Now, everybody always wants to talk about entrepreneurship and creating jobs. One of the great things about university spin-offs is the kinds of jobs they create. When people create companies that exploit university technology, that's not a job flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. That's something like making artificial skin. That's like something like a Google algorithm. Those are good jobs, both in terms of the um, intellectual environment for people and the pay that people get. The other thing that we know is that these companies, these spin-offs, often anchor and start industrial clusters. So you say, we need to get the Silicon X, right? Silicon Glen, Silicon Valley, Silicon blah, 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 Silicon Alley. All of those efforts of policymakers to get a Silicon something, the anchor tenant, if you will, the way to get that is to get the university spin-off companies because they then attract many of the other players in an ecosystem. They, in particular, attract venture capitalists. So many people talk about, well, X, Y, and Z area has no capital to invest in the startups. There's no venture capitalists, there's no critical mass. One way you get that critical mass is by creating these companies. Now you have something to show investors. Investors have reasons to hang around an area. And in particular, they're valuable companies. What do I mean by valuable companies? These are examples of university spin-off companies. Chiron, Genentech, Cirrus Logic, HP from an earlier era. Lycos no longer really around, but was once a valuable business. Perhaps the most important university spin-off ever was Google. Google's market value is bigger than all but 14 uh, companies, um, and it is bigger than places like Johnson & Johnson, Intel, Coca-Cola, etc. That's an example of, if you can get a Google out of a spin-off, that's great. Fantastic for Stanford, not so great for Case Western Reserve University, but we're going to try to get one of our own. Okay. You can see I spend some time talking to university presidents and provosts. That's what they want to hear. We'll have one just tomorrow. Uh, spin-off formation rates have been increasing dramatically. So if you actually go back to 1980, where the main law passed to enable, facilitate this activity, and you looked over time, you would see a largely linear trend. And in fact, one of the few measures of entrepreneurial activity in the United States that didn't dip and go down during the Great Recession and the really weak economic recovery that followed is university spin-off activity, which continues to rise. 
And they're increasing because of a couple things. One was going back to the 1980s, the U.S. really changed the university's IP rights and gave, made very clear that universities own the rights to intellectual property created by faculty, staff, and students on their campuses. Second big change is how patent law has changed. Gen um, the ability to patent genetic um, materials, software patents, the ability to have business method patents, all of these are patents that make it possible to have things going on on university campuses that have more commercial value than in a previous patent era. Growth in biomedical research as a percentage of total funding of research in different countries, and particularly the United States, has a huge effect because biotechnology and to some extent medical devices are big areas for this kind of company formation. And then the last and the one that I think is most important is that there's been a contagion effect. And this is really interesting when you look at the micro level of what's happened. People, early pioneers in this activity, would start a lab and became commercial, start a company, the company would be successful. Their success would attract a certain kind of student to those labs. Those students were then in those labs then got introductions to venture capitalists, to practicing managers that would help them develop a company. We got a second generation of people coming out of labs, then setting up their own labs and doing this, and we have a contagion of now academics who are quite entrepreneurial and quite successful in the spin-off activity in engineering and in the sciences. Now, this isn't everywhere. Some institutions do much better at this than others. And the question is why? What makes some universities have more spin-offs than others? There's several things across a variety of studies I've done that show the difference. One is investing in research excellence. Now, this is important because there is a non-linear relationship between excellence and spin-offs. You can license pretty well second and third tier research, but it's very hard to create companies unless you are at the first tier. So you see that in technical fields where institutions that are one or two in those technical fields tend to be the ones where there's a big increase in the spin-off activity in that field. So the takeaway for that from a policy perspective is if you want to have spin-offs, you need to have that top set of uh, um, researchers. Second is industry funding. There's a big effect of ties to industry in facilitating spin-offs, in part because that is the big way that academic researchers get their knowledge of industry problems that need to get solved is from their interaction with industry. A third one that's very important is something that a lot of institutions have blocked doing for all kinds of reasons, which is to block making equity investments in these companies. The prototypical way that you get a spin-off company started is that the university takes an equity position in return for paying the cash costs of the patent protection. In the absence of that, the cash cost is often too high for the spin-offs to bear and makes it hard for them to form. Now, Ironically, if you give inventors a big share of royalties, you ironically have given them an incentive not to start a business. So in royalties are generally shared between the inventor and other parts of the university. Okay? Now, if I, as an inventor, am getting all the royalties that flow in from my invention, then I don't really need to start a company to get a greater share of that value. Now, there might be other benefits of starting a company, but if my share of the royalties is very small, the only way I'm going to get a return on my money, my investment of time and effort, is if I start the business. So ironically, universities that basically keep most of the royalties to themselves are creating an incentive for people to start businesses to make money off of their equity. A fifth point is to license exclusively. There's two broad strategies of how you license university technology. Strategy one is license it non-exclusively to lots of people. No, you know, we don't know who's going to be successful and who isn't and somebody will come up with something that works, or I try to pick who I think is going to be most successful and license exclusively to them. 
A spin-off has no intellectual property protection other than its IP from the university, and it's got no other competitive advantages at the time it starts. If it doesn't get exclusive licensing, it will not have a strong enough position to compete. So institutions that refuse exclusive licensing have lagged behind other institutions in creating spin-offs. Encourage disclosures. This is a kind of ironic part, but much of the IP that leads to spin-off companies that results in this activity without conflict later and lawsuits occurring later occurs because the academics went and disclosed to the university they had an invention and then the university licensed the invention back to them and they started a company. Now, the way you get those people to sign disclosures is not sit there and wait for them to do it, because if you sit there and wait, they will never do it, because they're academics and they have a million other things they would rather do. So proactive efforts to get disclosures generates a willingness of the academics to participate in the system and produces the activity later. It is not that the academics are deliberately trying to go outside of the system, it's that they have no idea what the system is, therefore they take an action that causes problems later that preclude spin-offs from being able to form. Now, spin-offs are very rare. Okay? Only about 10% of patented university inventions are appropriate for spin-offs, and to have them, you need the right kind of technology, IP, industry, and inventor. And I want to talk a little bit about what we know about those different categories of activities. So what are the right technologies? What do we know about university inventions that lead to spin-offs? So technically more important inventions. So anytime somebody comes up with an invention, it has some effect. The effect can range. When people come up with inventions that improve something by 2%, they're not worthy of a spin-off. When they increase them by 200 and 300%, the order of magnitude is high enough to justify all the effort of creating a company. And that's one of the things that we found. Secondly is a radical or disruptive development. When people come up with things that are counter to the established norm of doing things in an industry, that is when you can overcome all the problems of inventors who are academics who know nothing about running businesses and still pull off a successful business. When they are doing something incremental that some big company out there is already doing, the company will eat their lunch. Okay? Third is that it's early stage. The academics do better when the stuff is very early. When things are early, they require a great deal of effort and there's a lot of risk involved. This is a lousy space for people who work for big companies and who do not have ownership stakes as an incentive. Nobody does something with a 5% probability of succeeding, okay, when they're going to get a bad performance appraisal if they fail in return for a pat on the back. They will do that for a chance to make a billion dollars. So that incentive problem is there when it's very early and it needs that development. It also, when it's early, needs the tacit knowledge in the minds of the inventor and the only way to get that is to have the inventor involved. General purpose or platform technologies are another one. So some technologies, like nanotechnology, like the microchip, like three-dimensional printing, are platforms. They can be applied in many industries, in many settings, in many ways. This is great for new companies to be created because what they do is allow companies to pivot. They can change from one thing to another depending on the outcome in one space or another. The best example I know, because I did a lot of work on the spin-offs that came out of MIT in the very early years of three-dimensional printing, where much of the three-dimensional printing technology got invented. Many companies had the rights of first refusal to those inventions. Boeing, United Technology, Falls Graph, right, all had the rights to the inventions. They all turned it down because they said, we can't make X. Boeing, we couldn't make aircraft wings out of it. Falls Graph, we couldn't make dinnerware out of it. United Technologies, we couldn't make anything of any of the conglomerate companies we have with it. So yet other people said, oh, but we could make filters for coal-powered uh, uh, 
coal-fired power plants. We can make microcapsules for drugs. We can make concept models for architects, right? And those were the businesses that got started because it had a general purpose in a lot of space. Last is that it's standalone. One of the reasons that so many successful university spin-off companies come in the drug space is because a drug is a standalone technology. To use a drug, I don't need anything else. What is hard to do is when I have invented some part of a motor, the motor has 99 other parts, and I don't have any of them. Because even if my one part is a dramatic improvement on that motor, I'm never getting access to somebody else's 99 parts because they would rather me fail and keep the status quo than work with me. So standalone technologies are key. Right industries, young industries. There's learning curves in industries. So when we're in different industries, right, the ones that are most successful for this activity are ones where the industry itself is really young and early so that the new companies are not behind the learning curve compared to other ones where the industry is really quickly segmented. You can break it down into lots of small pieces and go after small segments. That's the way that you can start small companies in general, and it works for spin-off companies, where patents work well. Patents are very effective in chemicals. Patents are very even more effective in drugs. They're very weak in other areas. Where patents are effective, now the spin-off, which is based on a patented technology, has a competitive advantage. Without that, what competitive advantage do you have for, for the company in the early years? Also, where complementary assets are not particularly important. In some industries, you really need a distribution system to succeed. You really need marketing and advertising to succeed. You need manufacturing to succeed. It's very hard for a university spin-off to succeed in that setting because they're not going to have those complementary assets. What we see is industries where those things are not so important, like Google, for example, where there's no manufacturing at all, okay, where the customer is producing the output that they're looking for, the spin-off works well. When the industry is fragmented, like for all new companies, it's easiest to break in in industries that are fragmented. The right IP, okay? University spin-offs only work when inventions are patentable, not trade secrets. Trade secrets work in the corporate world. They don't work in universities because universities can't keep secrets. There's no mechanism for keeping secrets. In fact, you get in trouble if all you do is keep secrets. That means you don't publish, which means you don't get tenure. So you get thrown out of a university if you're good at keeping secrets. Second, when composition of matter, the strongest types of patents are possible, that makes it strong. Broad scope patents, the ones that really block a lot of avenues. Because keep in mind that what you're doing is this is your competitive advantage in the early days. When the IP space around the patent is uncrowded, one of the problems that this ha happens is that patents are a negative right. I can enforce my patent by suing other people. I'm a startup. I'm going to get sued in the early years. I'm, my company's going to get killed by being involved in the lawsuit because I'm not going to have time. If I'm in a space that's very crowded, I'm probably going to get sued for infringement and that's going to kill my spinoff. If there's nobody around what I'm doing, then I'm not going to get sued for infringement. I'm in a better position. Sort of related to that is that the university, in fact, has clear title. There are many cases of bad spinoff decisions when two researchers at different universities starting a business together. It's not clear which university owns the IP or when company was working with the university. There were no clear rules for whether the company had right of first refusal. So if things don't go anywhere, nothing ever happens. If things succeed, some smart lawyer will go, ah, there's money there. Let's go after it. And this is messed up and we can get the money. Okay. So what's the right approach to building these companies? Okay. Like many startup companies, this is very much the same for the spin-offs. Going after a big market, 
billion dollar markets, not small 10 and 20 million dollar markets. We look at the history of university spinoffs, it's a very clear effect. Those that went after big markets were much more successful than ones that went after a small market. Almost always the successful ones started by not trying to do 10 things at once, but by focusing on a single market, by adding to their intellectual property, not worrying so much about what they had to start with, but how did they build the intellectual property position um, going forward creating a complementary team. This is a hugely important one, and the best example of this is to give you a story of two different MIT professors that I know creating companies. So Bob Langer is MIT's probably most prolific and successful inventor. He must have 10 or 12 companies that he started off his research that went to, develop, to go to IPO. Terry McGuire is a venture capitalist he's worked for years with, and Bob Langer, like any academic, he's not without an ego, but he said, I want to find somebody who's as good as me in a different space. So I want to find a venture capitalist who is at the top of the venture capital heap because I believe I'm the top of the world of chemical engineering. Okay, that's what he did, very successful. A different professor who, because he's guilty of what's not the best strategy, I will not name him, but was the chair of the mechanical engineering department at MIT at one time, um, had the philosophy, oh, science and engineering are hard, business is easy, anyone can do business, I'll find a doctoral student, get a textbook, assign the doctoral student to read the textbook, and then run the company. Now, in addition to the fact that that creates all kinds of rules, violations in a university because a doctoral student is not supposed to be assigned to run a company as a thesis. It's not worthy of a thesis in most technical fields, right? That person has no expertise, no credibility, etc. Keeping the inventor involved. You cannot throw university technology over the fence. If the inventor is not involved, they have so much tacit knowledge, it's necessary to keep them involved. Exploiting social ties to raise money. It is impossible to raise money for these kinds of businesses from complete strangers. This stuff is too uncertain, too few people understand it. You send this to um, strangers, they'll try to get you committed into a mental institution after they've talked to the SEC about some sort of securities fraud that they're suspecting because it came into their email just after the Nigerian lottery that they had just won, right? <laughs> Instead, if you go to people that you know, and in particular, the main way that the inventors got money is they went to venture capitalists that they knew, and how they know the venture capitalists? Because before, <laughs> venture capitalists needed somebody to do technical due diligence on a company four or five years before, and they did the technical due diligence, the did the science or engineering work, they kept the card, okay? Then later, they contacted that person. The person had a tie because they did something. They got paid to do some work for somebody. Generally, can, you can call somebody up like that in the future. The other thing about um, building these companies is they take a very long time, and, in the, and investors who are in it for the money do not like to invest early on because they cannot tell the time horizon. If you can't tell the time horizon, you can't know if it's a good investment or not. So you stay away. So what do you do? You get some kind of public money first, non-dilutive money that comes from the government for the sake of per pushing technology forward is a big avenue for building successful companies. So who are the right inventors? Which are the people who do this well? Well, one are people who have appropriate kinds of experience, and we'll talk about that in a minute, the right kinds of relationships, the right kind of personality, and the right view of their role. So what's the right experience? There's a huge effect of if people have started a company before out of a university, they're much more successful to start another one. If they have worked in an industry before where the technology is being used, they're much more likely to be successful. And if they were involved in pro product development, they're much more likely to be successful. Pure academics who have no startup experience, no industry experience, and have never gone down the product development route tend to make lousy starters of university spin-offs. The right relationships. These inventors, the ones who have more industry funding and therefore have to interact sometimes with people in the business world 
who ask them questions about things like what's the market need, what's the solution to a problem that the customers have is valuable. The ties to the venture capitalists and business angels that they already had from previous activity, usually doing too technical due diligence, was successful. And ties to executives in the industry where the technology would be used. The last point is particularly important because the successful companies get those executives into the team because the inventors say, I cannot be the chief marketing officer in this company or the CEO or the CFO because I don't know anything about anything that relates to business. Let's get somebody who does. The right kinds of personality here. We did um, a, uh, an interesting set of experiments with licensing officers a few years ago. We found a couple things. Inventors who have a high need for controlling everything may, do not make good spin-off company founders. In fact, academia is probably the last bastion of the I need 100% control of everything in the world that is it's tolerated by anyone. Okay, even there, it's not that well tolerated. The ability to work with others and has good communication skills. So in this experiment we ran, we randomly assigned certain characteristics of inventors to invention disclosures. And what we found was the gatekeepers at the universities who could put people in touch with spinoffs and uh, with investors and spinoffs and so forth would immediately reject the people who had who are difficult to work with or had bad communication skills, right? And so that's what happens. They get pushed aside. Willing to seek the complementary skills in others is the point I raised before about the difference between Bob Langer and the not named other uh, MIT department chair. So what's the right inventor attitude? So how do inventors want to think about companies? Well, believe it or not, many academ academics think that business is evil. The people who believe that business is evil should not start businesses, <laughs> okay? That's like believing that children are evil and cause nothing but problems that don't have children, right? Don't do things that you think are bad, right? But people do it, right? Want to create products that meet needs. The number of academic spin-off company founders who say, I want to do this so I can do more science, they, it doesn't make good companies. Another article in Science or Nature does not get a company public. I have never seen it happen. Okay, what you get is creating a product that meets a need gets you there. They are committed to building a company. They want to have a company, not, I'll do this 15 hours a week, sometime after I pick up my you know, son from hockey practice and before I need to you know, make dinner, right? That's not the way in which you build a company. Willing to build up, give up ownership and control. These companies require capital. The only thing you have to give to get capital is your equity. If you won't give it up, you won't go anywhere doesn't think he or she should be a CEO. So if we went and arrayed the less set of skills that it takes to be the CEO of a company, okay, a high-flying successful company, most academics would lack those skills. They've never managed people. If they've managed people, they've managed a handful of people. They know nothing about finance. They know nothing about accounting. They know nothing about marketing. They know nothing about um, the world of investing in startups, et cetera. That is not the profile of a good CEO. That's a profile, perhaps the person who would make a good job as the chief technical officer, and then let's go find a CEO. <coughs> they want to be involved in the further development of the technology. They care about the technology becoming a product in the marketplace, and they are willing to move away from the scientific cutting edge to do the product development to make that happen. If they're obsessed with the next Science or Nature article, they're never going to get there because they're not going to do what it takes to build a company. Now, all of this is a generally successful system that is creating a lot of wealth for universities. Some universities have generated a tremendous amount of resources for the future of their companies and their communities by support, um, supporting this activity. There are a few problematic trends from this effort. One of the things we've noticed is academics are changing where they concentrate their research efforts. One of the things that the Gates Foundation is terribly worried about and is giving a lot of money for the study of orphan diseases is researchers know that heart disease is the thing to solve if you want to start a company in the space, biomedical space, not 
a disease of the developing world, okay? Changes the research focus to things that have potential commercial outcomes as opposed to basic research that doesn't lead to commercial outcomes as well. It leads institutions to favor high commercialization departments. A few years ago, I gave this speech at an org uh, the group of uh, university provost meeting, and I got a, a bunch of university provosts agreeing that, yeah, it's really true that if they're faced with where do I add one position, if my cell biology department generates technology that I can make money off of, and my religious studies department is never going to do anything like that, yeah, it doesn't matter if the students really want one versus the other. To make the university budget work, we're going to shift the margin. If everybody does that at the margin each year, you see a shift in activity. More important than that is the hindering the exchange of ideas. There's good documented research evidence that shows that when people have equity in their own spin-off company, they delay publication of their research in academic journals by an average of six months' time. Slow publication slows the scientific advance, puts me in a better commercial position, less willing to share research tools for the same reason. I don't want to share a research tool with somebody else who might compete with me with a business that I have, and increases the potential for conflict of interest problems, and then the university infrastructure that's necessary for managing conflicts of interest where professors are running labs, and they're running startups, and they're trying to make decisions about what, do what their doctoral students are supposed to be doing, working in their lab, working in their company, et cetera. So those are the main things that I wanted to uh, bring up as topics. I'm happy to entertain um, comments and questions and challenges. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Scott Shane, for your great contribution. Uh, we're running a bit late in terms of time, but I will open the floor for some questions. Uh, Brian Darmany from the University of Maryland. Could you comment, Scott, on um, some universities have, have attempted to change tenure policies to provide incentives to faculty? Um, I'm personally a bit skeptical, but I, and I know there's been some research. Could you comment on, on, on that aspect of uh, technology spin-outs and commercialization? Yeah, so as, as far as I know, the universities that have, have changed the tenure policies have changed it from primarily a focus on pure research outputs like journal articles to quasi-research outputs like patents. I have not seen a serious research university substitute a non-advanced to academic knowledge, substitute away from either papers or, or patents. I, that may come, but I think there, that's the big resistance because it's, if it's not a research output of some kind, how do you judge whether the person is a researcher, which is a big part of the job? So um, my name is uh, Frank Vereinsover. I work at Utah University, and thank you for your interesting speech. Uh, I have two related questions. Uh, first one is uh, what you, when I count all these things together, you know, these are like paradigm-breaking companies. I was just wondering, like, how many companies a year would be, you be able to, to, to create? Because if all these people here in this room are going to stimulate those companies, then, well, I don't know whether they all can be successful. And the second one, the question is related to the topic you say, go to a technology space for your patent that's not too crowded. Isn't it also not very common that those not so crowded uh, spaces, that they are probably more likely uh, from the market, so it's also more uh, difficult to commercialize those uh, spaces? Okay, so I'll, I'll respond to two parts. The second one I'll deal with sooner, which is that the comment about the IP space being crowded is very specific to university spin-offs, where we're talking about a company that has its patent as the key source of its competitive advantage. If it has a patent that is very close to somebody else's patent and it's going to end up in an infringement lawsuit from proceeding, that's the problem. If you're talking about non if you're talking about technology startups that aren't IP based or other academic entrepreneurship that's not IP based, now you're less worried because there's no patent to infringe necessarily. Now you're talking about 
you might want to take a different tack and worry more about the market side. Okay, so that's, the, that's that question. The first question on the magnitude of this is, we're talking about a couple thousand companies in the United States that are being founded every year. Now, what's remarkable about this is that in the US, we've probably got about a million or to two million companies being founded every year, right? So this is a small percentage. Of the number of companies that get founded every year, we know that approximately 100 on average companies go public every year, right? So it's a tiny fraction. We know of the university spin-offs, however, that the percentage that go public are in the high single digits. Okay, so it's an order of magnitude many times higher, and similar statistics are true for the mergers and acquisitions. So it's not a volume thing. It's not that there's going to be so many companies. If what you were worried about is keeping people busy, university spin-offs are not a way to keep people busy, right? On the other hand, high-impact businesses, if you want high-potential businesses, the odds are much greater that they will be high-potential companies than the average company getting started. Oh, well, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. I think I agree with 95% of what you said, except the uh, aspects about royalties. I used to be at Caltech, and yes, 10% of royalties go to all inventors, so you end up with a very small amount of royalties. However, at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, uh, we have been very successful attracting top faculty from the world. So if you're interested in 60% royalties, please apply to KAUST. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I, I do actually have a question myself. Um, it was 2008 when you wrote that or published that bestseller, there's still people talk about the illusions of entrepreneurship. It has the subtitle of the costly myths that entrepreneurs, investors, and policymakers live by. So today, seven years later, I'm wondering which one do you think is the largest or most costly myth in entrepreneurship? If I had to sum up all the myths under one umbrella, it is the belief that new business, the typical new business is a substantive and likely to be successful entity. The Federal Reserve just released a new paper that looked at the survey of consumer finances and they showed data on representative sample of U.S. new and small businesses. The new, the new businesses, typical number of employees is one. The existing small businesses, typical number of employees is one. The typical uh, revenues of an established small business in the United States is about $80,000 a year. The typical revenues of a new Business in the United States is about $7,000 a year. These are minuscule numbers. The myth is that when we look at entrepreneurship, we should look at the typical outcome and assume it's a good thing and then go from there. What we should look at is to flip it around. The typical is bad and we need to understand good. We need to look at the outliers only because it's the outliers that tell the important story. The typical or median outcome is not good. All right, thanks a lot. I think that's actually a statement that, as well as your book did, make people to think or rethink entrepreneurship a bit the other way around, or differently as they've been thinking about it until that moment. Right, and if I just can draw the parallel between that book and that question and this topic, this is why I believe that university spin-offs are so important, because the typical outcome of a university spin-off company is so much greater than the outcome of a typical company that gets started that when we think about allocation of resources at a societal level by policymakers, where do you want to put your resources? You want to put your resources in the things that could have the big outcomes. Professor Shane, thank you very much for the, the presentation. I think uh, it encapsulated a lot of the thoughts that we've, we've heard at the conference so far. Um, one of the questions I had, because we've uh, I've spent a little bit of time in, in Latin America, uh, as an example, and also in Africa. 
And we're looking at universities there as well as also even just within the European environment. And the one thing that you pointed out was that it, for a, well, perhaps not a successful, but a, a likely to be more successful venture uh, spin out, um, you need a high quality level of research. Now, not all universities um, in different locations around the world have the capabilities of having the best researchers within a, a given field. In that context, what sort of advice might you, might you give for that? Should they be pursuing it as a long-term strategy or should it be something that they maybe don't even consider? Or I was interested to get your thoughts on that. So I guess I would make two comments. The first comment is that, in general, universities, wherever they are, have a distribution of the relative strengths of their departments. So there's areas, for example, where one might not think that um, particular places are necessarily strong for all areas of knowledge development, but they might be particularly strong in petroleum engineering, or they might be particularly strong in the study of um, the use of traditional medicines, for example, right? So I, I would not, and, and, and in other areas. So one part is, well, where's the strength, where's the research leadership occur in those um, institutions, if you want to have spin-offs, you put your resources behind those. If there's nowhere that there's really any leadership position, then you're faced with a two-part strategy. One is to say, can we build it over time? Some institutions have done this. This is the kind of model um, that uh, you know, National University of Singapore followed, for example, which was to send people to top universities for their education, bring them back, and over time build their way up to be top research places. That's one. The other alternative is to say university spin-offs are not the only way to make great companies. Maybe do something else other than university spin-offs as a way to generate companies in that area. So probably there's many countries for which university spin-offs not the avenue for creating successful startups. Thank you.